in, in Israel, uh, and then we'll start our interview. Yeah, I, um, I hate to, to say this because it feels like I might be rubbing salt on a wound here. Um, we're, we're kind of done with quarantine. Um, we're, uh, schools are open. Um, we're, not a, we're not at 100% yet. Trains are not running, which is particularly important to me. Um, because I take the train to Tel Aviv each day. Um, but otherwise, they're, they're talking about opening synagogues already next week for Shavuot. Um, restaurants, sort of everything is, is getting back to normal. We have no new cases today, which I think makes two or three days in a row. And so we're just about, uh, we're just about past it. Wow. Uh, they're going to be opening up without restriction, at full capacity? Uh, just about, yeah. We... Um, they're gonna, I think we're gonna continue to have social distancing, but the thing about social distancing is it's really difficult to maintain. Um, that I found, for example, that like getting on a bus, you're not allowed to sit next to someone else, but when you get on the bus, you push and shove everyone else. So it's sort of like there's there's only so much you can do. So we're, we're, uh, we're basically gonna be back to no restrictions uh, within uh, a week or so, I think. Gotcha, wow, remarkable. Yeah, different story here. Uh, yeah. So let's, uh, here we go. So you're a uh, nice Jewish boy uh, at Rice University. And um, tell us about your Jewish home and then uh, how you were practicing at Rice University and then uh, post Rice as your high school teacher. So yeah, so my family is, uh, belongs to a reconstructionist shul. Um, and we grew up as um, sort of the active end, I think, of that, um, which is, I think, the, uh, the really important um, factor to say is that my, uh, my family had, um, you know, Shabbat dinner Friday nights, um, two seders each year that we host both of them, um, Rosh Hashanah, uh, Hanukkah, uh, Yom Kippur, which my mom hates cooking for. Um, so like a sort of an active uh, reconstructionist home. When I got to college though, it wasn't the most important thing to me. Rice at the time didn't have a Hillel. I don't know if it does now, um, but at the time it didn't. And that wasn't really a, something that I was looking for. It wasn't a concern for me. Um, and I was sort of minimally active, not very much and then occasionally something would happen that sort of drew me in but generally speaking not so much connection um and how so many a high school teacher for um i was a high school teacher for five years uh, and in that time i never had a jewish colleague mm -hmm. uh three years at yes prep public schools the charter system and then two years at saint agnes academy um, less surprising that I didn't have a Jewish colleague at St. Agnes, I should know. Um, and, um, and tell us about the events that turned, started to turn that around. So I, um, I went to, I came to Israel, birthright, uh, in 2013. Um, and it was completely life-changing. Um, I think, uh, I think one of the things that made it so powerful for me was the contrast because I was like so disconnected from the Jewish community because I didn't have any uh, Jewish friends in Houston uh, because I wasn't a part of a community coming to Israel and being all of a sudden immersed in this Jewish environment, even for a week and a half was so incredible that it um, propelled me to, um, to seek out more Jewish connection uh, which led me to Brit Shalom, uh, which led me to your your dining room, um, and uh, and ultimately back to Israel. Okay, and your choice. So after some time, you're pursuing a medical career. I so as I was finishing um, my fifth year teaching high school, I decided that that wasn't uh, what I wanted to keep doing. I was thinking about making Aliyah. I wasn't sure what to do. And so uh, one of the things that I've always had a passion for is science and medicine. Um, and so I started um, preparing and then I took the MCATs and applied to medical school. 
uh, and during the year, right, because the, uh, the application process is basically a full year. You have to get your applications in uh, in the fall, and then they do first round interviews in the winter, and then second round interviews in the next fall you start. So it's a full year of uh, application. And so during that year, I was in Israel um, doing uh, an internship and was just really torn about Aliyah and being far from my family um, and ultimately decided that uh, what I really wanted to do was to um, go back to the States to be closer to my family, um, but to do so not as a doctor, but as a rabbi so that I could also um, have that really strong connection to Israel and to the Jewish community uh, even from America. And, and you so, were there. I remember during that time that um, one of the examples of the way that your passion for Judaism played itself out was through collecting nigunim. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah, I had a, I had a, a lot of uh, nigunim. I had a spreadsheet going. I, I have a really hard time remembering um, all the ones that I know. Um, so it, it's good if someone else starts that I can join in but it means that I sort of can't always. So I, I had a, like a spreadsheet going. I was trying to help myself keep track so that I could remember them. Yeah, you were pretty deep into it. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. then things turned around uh, once again. So yeah, so after a couple of years in the States in rabbinical school, I, um, I decided that, uh, I think a couple of things, um, but, um, the, um, the sort of straw that broke the camel's back um, was uh, the day after um, Israeli Independence Day, a few years ago, um, when we got to the prayer for uh, the ingathering of the exiles. Um, and the words are, uh, sound, sound the great shofar of freedom and give a sign, and give a sign for the ingathering of the exiles. And I just felt like uh, those words, give a sign for the ingathering of the exiles. I feel for me like the sign has been given. And um, so to ignore that sign uh, felt really difficult. And the sign is uh, the rebuilding of the modern state of Israel? Yeah. Um, the creation of the state of Israel, the, the miracles that have uh, allowed the state to um, to become and not only to exist but to thrive, um, I think are are examples of of modern day miracles. And uh, so it pulled me in. You're a religious Zionist. Is that how you would categorize? I'm a religious Zionist. Yeah, I yeah the religious Zionist camp uh, has a further right political agenda than I do, I think, but I, I define as a religious Zionist other than that. Right. <laughs> uh, right. I wasn't getting political quite yet, but I was leading in that direction. Yeah, yeah. But your uh, Zionism is based in uh, a religious calling. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I, not exclusively, but I but also definitely. All right, so uh, tell us about your Aliyah um, and the, particularly your Aliyah day. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so I made Aliyah um, two and a half years ago, a little over two and a half years ago. And uh, a friend of mine uh, in Jerusalem, I messaged him, you know, I'm coming to Israel, whatever. Um, I would love to, said to him, you know, I'd love to get together, whatever. And he said, uh, well, you should come to this event that uh, I'm going to be at tonight, uh, Yair Lapid, who at the time was the, uh, hold on a second, in 2017, he was a uh, leader of a large party. He was not the leader of the opposition, but he was leader of a large opposition party. Um, and um, so I said, sure. Um, and uh, so I went to that event. And um, people in Israel, it was a great, like, introduction to Israeli uh, kind of culture or whatever, in the sense that when Americans meet a politician, if you have a question, you preface it with, uh, hi, thank you so much for taking the time. It's such an honor to have this opportunity. I'd like to ask, in Israel, you don't do that. 
So people would just like take the mic and say, yeah, yeah. your stance on transportation is terrible. Um, so it was this like kind of incredible experience. So I, anyhow, they, because it was so informal, I went up to him afterwards uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, asked me when I made Aliyah. And he said, when did you make Aliyah? And I said about nine hours ago. Um, so uh, I had my picture taken with him and then he put it on his Facebook page um, and said a little bit about me. Um, and a couple days later, the real highlight of the story is a couple days later, someone saw me. I was like, oh my God, you're that guy from Lapid's Facebook page. And I was like, yes, <laughs> I am that guy. And it was an emotional day for you, the your day of Aliyah. Tell us about uh, your emotional. Um, <laughs> uh, when I just had like the breakdown in the Nefesh yeah, office. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, in, the, in the offices of the uh, organization that was helping me make Aliyah, which is called Nefesh Benefesh, um, when they handed me my Israeli ID, um, it um, felt, um, it still feels uh, that so many um, years, centuries, uh, millennia of prayers uh, are being answered by my being here, that um, it's, it's a really powerful feeling. And so when that first happened, I, uh, I started crying in the office. <laughs> And it's a uh, yeah, uh, it's a visual uh, right? it has stuck with me, right? Of uh, you know, grown man having a breakdown. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. And so when you <laughs> so clearly right, you have this passion and um, determination um, in your Zionism. Um, what are the challenges of Moving to Israel, however, is one of the practical aspects of it. So tell us a little bit about your integration into Israeli life. Yeah, so I had, uh, I had the best um, immigration helpers, um, which were my roommates. So because I made Aliyah as an individual, um, I did not have, you know, uh, um, like people that come as a family, you living with your family when you get here. Um, and I was not living with Americans, I was living with Israelis. So I had a kind of zero to 60, I got here um, off and running um, in a Hebrew speaking apartment, um, listening to the Israeli radio and Israeli news, um, getting a master's at Hebrew University, um, where the lab you know, was working in Hebrew um, so it was, it was a lot, um, happening all at once. And tell us uh, about, your go ahead. Tell us about your studies while you're there. Um, so I, um, if you're keeping track of the sort of zigzagging career path that I've had, we're, we're back to the, the science-y stuff. So I got a master's in chemistry and working in biomedical. Um, materials, and I'm now getting a PhD in biotechnology. Um, and so if anyone is thinking of having a heart attack, I would hold off for like five, 10 years. I'm hoping to have a treatment. That's specifically what I'm working on. If, if at all possible, you should that's delay good. that uh, just a little bit longer. Timing. That's probably good timing for me. <laughs> yes, it's exactly. It's for you in mind um, that I'm... Uh, that I'm sorry, Dad. I, uh, um, so uh, um, so yeah. So those are my uh, so those are my studies. Um, and um, and yeah, I think I, I think in part because uh, so much of this is just driven by my passion that I also sort of threw myself into it. Um, reading Israeli news, listening to Israeli music. Um, I don't know, going to Israeli sites. Uh, but not necessarily like the touristy ones, um, eating at restaurants, um, just sort of trying to, to acclimate as like a real Israeli. Beautiful. And uh, so take us through your PowerPoint and give us some insight into the roots of your Zionism and some of the sort of current issues that uh, face yeah. so the modern. This guy here. 
So, um, so what I wanted to, to talk about then, which I think is um, a really exciting piece of uh, my life right now, um, is being in Israel 72 years after the creation of the state. Um, because um, 72 years seems to be something of a natural timeline. Um, I noticed this as I was kind of getting ready for this, that, um, that from George Washington becoming president to the outbreak of the Civil War was 72 years. Um, so there's something about 72 years that like the burst of unity and pride that brought us all together, we've gotten rid of that. Um, and in the case of Israel, the existential crises uh, of war, of economic crisis, of drought, whatever it is that kept the people together uh, have been, thank God, reduced to a minimum. And it gives us a chance then to really think about who we are, who we want to be, um, and what that looks like moving forward. So um, I wanted to start by uh, sharing the Israeli Declaration of Independence. And we're going to come back to a couple of, uh, of the key points here. But this was written by um, David Ben-Gurion in 1948. And you can see he starts with Eretz Yisrael is the birthplace of the Jewish people. Um, the catastrophe which recently befell the Jewish people, so talking about the Holocaust. Uh, and then he goes through, and we're going to now go through these points. Um, I think what he does is he lays out the vision for a Jewish and democratic state. And I think that that vision is being sort of realized and redefined now, and that's what makes this so exciting. So he starts by talking um, about the history of the Jewish people. It's the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here, their spiritual, religious, political identity was shaped. Here, they first attained statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, gave the world the book of books. Um, so one of the things I think he's laying out, which we people still talk about today, is the historical attachment, that Israel is a Jewish state because there's a historical attachment here. Um, he also talks about the Holocaust um, and uh, um, says that it was another clear demonstration, the urgency of solving the problem of our homelessness. Um, and likewise, that's something that's still on the table today, that this is a safe haven for the Jewish people. Um, and uh, he also talks about getting involved in, he says here, the task of immigration um, and getting a Jewish majority, which is also something that is, when we think about what it is to be a Jewish state, I think is a big part of it. Uh, at the same time, he lays out that this is a democratic institution uh, and says, um, you know, in this very sort of dry paragraph, uh, from the moment of termination of the mandate till the establishment of the elected regular authorities in accordance with the constitution, which shall be adopted, which for the record, there is no constitution 72 years later. Um, all of that is sort of the, the democratic side of this. And then near the end, I think he lays out the tension in being a Jewish and democratic state. Um, in the same sentence where he talks about Jewish immigration and the ingathering of the exiles, he says that it's for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It'll be based on freedom, justice, and peace which lots of countries are based on freedom, justice, and peace. Those are kind of universal values. But then he says, which is unique here, as envisaged by the prophets of Israel, which is an amazing kind of twist on, uh, on all of it, that we have this history, that that part of, of our freedom is, is that it's a, it's a Jewish value. Part of our justice is that it's a Jewish value. Um, he then goes on and talks about um, having complete equality, social and political rights, um, and relates it to the Charter of the United Nations. So there's this like universal and particularist, are we like every other nation in the UN or are we something unique? Um, he ends with um, placing our trust uh, in the Almighty, which is a terrible translation. Um, he says, Sur Israel, the rock of Israel. Um, which is, I think, intentionally more vague than just the Almighty. Um, again, returns to this as a provisional council. It's just a democratic, you know, process, whatever, on the soil of the homeland, which is an amazing phrase, I think. Um, 
he dates it with the Hebrew date, um, Erev Shabbat. Um, I think that these sort of tensions that he's laying out there, we didn't make a lot of progress in defining how we're going to deal with them while we were um, fighting for our survival, while, while we needed to work together to make sure that the country continued to exist. Um, and it's really only now that we're able to have these kind of incredible conversations uh, about what these things mean. Um, so I'll bring, do you want me to keep going? Bring my, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I have a couple examples here. Um, the first one is um, my, my vote for the most pressing uh, political issue. Um, and that's the role of the Supreme Court. So um, it's a question that, um, that I think every democracy needs to define for itself. Uh, the Supreme Court is sort of an inherently undemocratic system. Um, they're not responsible to the people. Um, what they say goes, uh, it's just a few of them. But uh, it also feels like a really important institution. Uh, and in Israel, there's been a lot of conversation uh, recently about what their role should be. Um, so I have here two, two cartoons, the one uh, on the left with the judge in the wig uh, is from last week. So it's a very recent issue. Um, you can see he says, no time like Lag Bomer to get rid of useless items. And then the Supreme Court is lighting the ballots on fire. So specifically, this is a political cartoon. The question before the court was, can uh, a man with indict, can a person with indictments uh, serve as prime minister? And the legal question, there's some ambiguities in the law, but ultimately um, in the most recent election, um, Bibi received, or Bibi's party, the Likud, received 36 mandates out of 120. Um, so over a quarter of the vote went to his party. And if the Supreme Court were to say that he's not allowed to be prime minister, many people would say that's them throwing away the vote of the people. The people voted for him, or at least a large percentage did. Uh, and the Supreme Court doesn't get to make that sort of decision. Um, on the other hand, um, many people would say that the Supreme Court is precisely there to ensure that um, there are certain things that are sort of beyond the people um, and uh, that they have to have that, that right. Um, the cartoon on the, on the right then is sort of the other side of it. Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Shaked um, have been uh, over the last several years, two leaders of the move to um, reduce the power of the Supreme Court and make it subservient to the Knesset and to the democratic process. Um, and uh, I think what's really interesting in comparing this to America, two things that I'll, that I'll say that I think are really interesting. The first is that in America, the Supreme Court justices are chosen by politicians. And there's a lot of talk about how it's too political. Uh, and I certainly came to Israel with the perspective of, wouldn't it be great if the judges chose the judges and we didn't have to deal with this political infighting? Well, in Israel, the judges choose the judges, among other, that's a kind of whole uh, committee thing, but they have a, um, a large block on the committee. And as a result, no one can get to the Supreme Court that isn't in agreement with the judges who are already there. And so the Supreme Court is stuck as it was, you know, 70 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever it is. It hasn't changed since then because the judges from then have gotten to kind of promote their own views. Um, and so despite the fact that the uh, that Bibi's party, the Likud, this right, more right-wing party has been in power now for 25 years, just about, they really haven't been able to affect the court at all. Um, and uh, so where exactly the, the responsibility of the politicians and the democratic process in there, I think is a, is a question. 
Uh, and the other thing that's been a big, uh, big point of discussion about the Supreme Court is who has the ultimate authority. So by analogy in America, if the Supreme Court rules that something is unconstitutional, theoretically, the people can um, pass a constitutional amendment. Very difficult, it hasn't happened in a while, but theoretically, the ultimate power lies with the people. Uh, in Israel, it's not clear where the ultimate power is. Um, as it stands, the Supreme Court has the ultimate power, but because it's not set in stone, um, people like Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Shaked from this cartoon here would say that they think the ultimate power should be with the people and that the democratically elected members of the Knesset should be able to vote to overturn a Supreme Court decision. Um, and this has become a really, really big question uh, in politics. It's one of, the, uh, one of the main sticking points for this uh, new government that was just formed yesterday um, was what to do about the courts. And um, the answer is they're not gonna do anything. They're just gonna kick the can uh, for a few years down the road and then we'll see. Right. Give us a little bit of insight into the Israeli support that Prime Minister Netanyahu seems to enjoy. Like why, why has the Israeli man on the street supported Netanyahu even through these indictments? So I think the first thing I would say is that um, the fact that he is prime minister in the system that Israel has um, does not necessarily reflect uh, how much support he has. He has somewhere around a third of the country uh, is supporting him. And it's because of the way the parliamentary system works that he then becomes prime minister. That's um, enough in a parliamentary system. What's that? That's enough in the parliamentary system to maintain power? In, in Israel, it is. So in Britain's parliamentary system, the Labour Party has an absolute majority. Um, they, more than 50% of the people supported the Conservative uh, Party in the, last, um, in the last election. In Israel, the largest party has 36, which out of 120 is, um, is somewhere around 30%. Um, so it just happens to be in the Israeli system that that is enough. Um, so I think that's part of it is that it, because it kind of channels into one leader at the end, it looks like he has more support than he really has. Um, the other thing I think is that he has uh, really and truly um, done a number of really positive things for the state of Israel. And most importantly for many people um, is that Israel has never been safer. Um, Israel was fighting major wars um, up until the 80s. Uh, and in the 90s, it started dealing with uh, serious terrorist attacks. And since sort of 2005 or six, um, other than a total of two months worth of fighting in Gaza, um, Israel has really been sort of safe from all of that. Um, there are still stabbings uh, and car rammings, but they're um, pretty rare. Um, and, you know, I can't speak to it because I was never here during those times. But um, I think if you, um, if you got on a bus to go to school, got off the bus and the next stop watched it blow up, um, and you know that 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 was you. You happened to be that they blew it up after you got off, but there's no reason that you're still alive. Um, and someone says, listen, I'm going to keep you safe. I think that counts for a lot. And so I think that that uh, that mentality, I think, is also really important to understanding his appeal. Right. This is security efforts and success. Yeah. Yeah. All right, beautiful, keep going. All right, so um, so that was the, I'll just say sort of in, in passing before we go on to the, uh, the next thing here that um, the uh, one of the main questions moving forward for this government is um, how much, it's not clear that anyone in his party really likes Bibi. 
right? His political support comes from the people, the people that he actually works with. It's not clear that anyone likes him. He's something of a backstabber. Um, and now that he has said in a year and a half, I'm gonna be done with being prime minister, it's, it'll be really, really interesting to see in his party whether he's able to hold any power or at that point, just kind of everyone turns um, on him. So it'll be sort of an interesting side thing. Right, well, before you move on, so, so tell us about the events of today and um, what the new deal is um, with the current government. Yeah. Um, no one knows. So yesterday, uh, the, um, the government was sworn in. It is uh, a unity government which means that it is the two uh, largest parties have gotten together. Um, it basically, um, the only options were to form a unity government or to have more elections. Um, and there are those who say that uh, elections may be expensive and they you know, are a pain in the butt and we need a government, but it's better to have elections than to have um, someone uh, as prime minister with indictments. It's better to have elections than to allow the ultra-Orthodox to dominate the conversation. It's better to have elections than to whatever the ifs are. Um, and Benny Gantz decided that he felt differently that despite having campaigned against Netanyahu, despite being uh, opposed to someone with indictment serving, despite being opposed to having the Haredim with religious power, um, it was time to put an end to elections. And so the, uh, the current government is just a totally different look than what we've had before. Um, the, it's the main center right block without the right wing parties uh, and the main center block without the further left parties. So it's very much a centrist government um, it includes the ultra-Orthodox, um, but it also includes many kind of avowedly secular parties. Um, so it'll it'll just be a really interesting to see what, what they're able to do moving forward. And um, when we have elections again in a few years' time, what the people will say um, to these parties that have chosen to get together. You know, if you... If you're in the center left and you join with BB, maybe you won't get any votes anymore because you're too right wing, you're too BB. Uh, but it also could be the case that people will say, you know, why are you sitting out? We have a unity government and you've chosen not to be a part of it. Why would I vote for you? And so the people who are not in government may lose out. It'll just be a new thing when we get to the next round of elections in three years. Right, right. Beautiful. Okay, so give us another. Um... Another giant issue in Israel society uh, is secular versus religious. Give us just a couple of minutes on this as I'm more interested in the next slide, but go ahead. Yeah, so um, this is, uh, the Hebrew word is hadata, which means religious coercion. Um, and it appears in lots of different ways. The big question is what is a Jewish state's Judaism? Uh, or does, a Jew does the Jewish state have its own Judaism? So this, uh, this was a big deal. Several months ago, there were a bunch of concerts that were segregated by gender. Um, they were con concerts sort of intended for the Orthodox community, right? These were not pop concerts with scantily clad women and then men and women sat separately. These were Orthodox concerts, um, but obviously even in an Orthodox concert, if you want to attend, you're welcome to attend. So then if you're being told you can't sit where you want to, uh, on the one hand, that's unacceptable. Uh, and people were exactly right to complain that that is discrimination. On the other hand, um, if you don't have that separation, then the ultra-Orthodox community is not able to participate in communal life um, by their own strictures. Uh, and so um, if you think it's important to have events um, I can tell you in Jerusalem this week, they're having um, the end of Ramadan events. And I can attend if I want, they're not limiting it, but it's not really for me and it won't be in a language that I understand. It's intended for the Arab population. Um, and I think generally we say like, that's okay. You can have events for a certain population. They don't all need to be for me. 
but then in the case of the ultra-Orthodox, is it going too far if it's gender segregated? Uh, we didn't get an answer. It remains sort of a, an issue uh, on the table. That sounds like you can see, genuinely see both sides of the argument. Uh, I genuinely see both sides of the argument. Um, and I, I think the right answer, incidentally, is what the Attorney General said, which is he made a statement saying the official policy is uh, it is acceptable to have gender segregated concerts. They should never be done because it's such discrimination, but it is acceptable if it meets the threshold and the threshold is, does it need to happen? Which is like the most meaningless. It was so, and I'm with him. I agree. I agree. That's how I feel. <laughs> all right, beautiful. Next. Um, all right, so the, um, the last issue that I wanted to, to talk about a little bit here is um, LGBT issues, which are um, sort of at the intersection maybe of the Jewish and democratic state. Um, there are things that democratic states that have no Jewish connection are dealing with. Uh, and they're maybe a little bit more difficult when you throw in the Jewish element. Um, so I broke it down uh, into three categories. There are things where uh, Israel has equal treatment. Uh, Israel is um, ahead of its time compared to most nations uh, in terms of having um, equal service opportunities for LGBT people. Um, it recently, the law was changed if you are transgender um, and um, you feel that you need a um, sex change operation that's covered by um, national health care for soldiers, um, for everyone, and including for soldiers. Um, so really providing opportunities, workplace discrimination um, is banned across the board. Um, services, you cannot choose to not allow a gay couple to host an event. Um, it was recently decided that even if your newspaper gears to a religious audience, you have to print ads from uh, gay organizations that want to advertise. Um, so the gay religious group um, put an ad in sort of the mainstream religious paper um, and the paper refused and they sued and they won the case that, that uh, they have a right to, to buy space equally. Um, Tell us about the gay religious group. It's a fun group. Um, we, uh, uh, there's a couple of different groups, um, segregated by gender, obviously, because it's religious and still like a little bit kind of not quite, you know, uh, as progressive as you might think for a gay organization. Um, but uh, it's becoming um, more mainstream. Um, What's the name? It's called, the one that, the, the one for men is called Chavruta, which is, uh, Friendship it means study partner. I don't know exactly how you, if it has a larger meaning in Arabic. Um, and then there's one called Bat Kol, which is um, a clever play on words, and that's a women's group. Um, and um, yeah, they're they're growing. Um, they're becoming more and more mainstream. Um, and they're also just you know the number of people as they grow, people are becoming more just kind of visible in the community. So um, there's a reality TV show um, called Come Eat With Us, where three uh, people host each other for meals. And after each meal, you vote on how well they hosted and whoever hosts the best gets wins a trip or whatever. Um, and a gay couple, a gay religious couple hosted uh, a meal and won their episode not so long ago. Um, and it was just, you know, they talked about being a gay religious couple and it was like not, you know, a big deal to them. So it was, uh, it was cool to, to see that. Wow. Keep oats or goat? What's the, what kind of, that, where, where do they fit into Israeli religious society? Into um, they are uh, Orthodox. Um, this particular couple, they, uh, they're Orthodox. In general, in, gen in general, religious in Israel means Orthodox. Um, there's there's really only a small contribution um, from other streams. Um, I would say they're sort of part of liberal orthodoxy, um, but, um, but they're definitely still orthodox. And perhaps not surprisingly, I should say one guy in this couple is Canadian uh, and much of the gay religious population here is Olim. Uh, it's something sort of being driven by diaspora uh, changing views. Um, which is a cool, which is also a cool thing to, to see. Yeah, it means we're in 
dialogue and in relationship, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, the issue of marriage, I labeled it here as equal discrimination. Um, marriage in Israel is a mess. Um, it, uh, for lots of weird, compl complicated reasons, you have to have an, uh, an ultra-Orthodox wedding. Um, the, you have to get taught by a rabbi how to maintain your purity. Um, you have to go to the mikvah um, for the women. You, um, you can't have a woman uh, give you blessings at your wedding. Um, so the fact that there's no gay marriage in Israel is like the least of the problems. So it's just the marriage thing is so messy that the fact that they have no gay marriage is like, well, of course not. That's, we should, you know, figure out weddings more generally before Many we worry. Many choose to go to Cyprus to get married and then fly back. Yeah, so, uh, so there's a, they're separate. If you get married in Israel, it has to be ultra-Orthodox. If you get married out of Israel, they'll recognize your marriage even if it wasn't ultra -Orthodox, even if it wasn't religious at all. So if you fly to another country, Cyprus is very close and very popular, you can get married there. And then when you come back, you're married. But then how do you get divorced? It's like a whole nother question. Um, and now there are no flights to Cyprus. So people are, uh, I have a friend who actually is sort of debating whether he had refused to get married by the ultra-Orthodox. Now he's like, maybe I just don't care enough because otherwise, what are we going to do? Um, so it's sort of a, it's a, that one's just a mess. Um, so it's, but I, I would like to say that it's, there is no specifically anti-gay discrimination there, which, you know, may or may not be a good thing. Um, and then um, the last one where there is really specific uh, anti-gay legislation is in adoption. Um, this is one of the ones to, to tie it back into the politics um, that uh, the central left party campaigned hard on saying, we are going to change this. We are going to allow gay couples to adopt. Um, they, they went back on that in order to join with Netanyahu uh, and more specifically with the ultra-Orthodox. They had to agree to drop that. Um, so it will continue to be the case that um, the state does not um, allow, does not support gay adoption. You can do it sort of privately, internationally, but um, without state support. Um, gay couples cannot use surrogacy uh, in Israel. Um, and, uh, and getting custody, joint custody, um, is, a, is a big fight. Uh, and that includes for, uh, for lesbian couples that if one of the partners chooses to carry the child, making sure that both parents then get rights, get, get parental rights is a huge battle um, mm -hmm. because the government just doesn't want to allow the couple. Um, there's sort of nothing they can do, a woman can engage in surrogacy. Um, so that part they sort of have to allow, but then they, they fight um, uh, when it becomes a couple issue. Um, and it's not top of the agenda for the politicians. So it's not, it's not going to change in the near future, um, and uh, I, you know, I can only say personally that I, uh, I I understand that it's not everyone's issue and therefore isn't driving the conversation in Israel. Um, but I just think it's really really sad that uh, uh, that that's going to continue to uh, to be the case. Gotcha. All right. Good. What's next on your we're going to um, I know we're, we're sort of uh, we're running out of time here, so I, I just wanted to to say before uh, before going that this is only kind of tip of the iceberg in how much Israel is is trying to figure out right now. The economy is changing um, from a socialist system to a capitalist system or a more capitalist system. Public transportation on Shabbat is another big uh, issue for religious coercion, uh, where the Judaism is there. Um, it used to be the case up until like two weeks ago that you were not allowed to bring comets into public spaces during Passover, like at a hospital. They would stop you at the door and check you for comets. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that illegal like two weeks ago. Um, so that one just changed unless something happens. Um, term limits for the prime minister is another big issue for democracy that's talked about. Um, it's something that Bibi promised to do back when he wasn't prime minister. It's something that Benny Gantz promised to do before he was prime minister. 
Um, there seems to be a thing about being prime minister that all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'll just keep being prime minister. Um, but that changes. Um, and then um, dealing with, uh, with minorities and, and how to incorporate minorities uh, more fully into system, whether they be Arabs uh, or Haredim, I think is, a, uh, is, a, is another kind of pressing issue for Israel uh, dealing with. And that's, um, that's what I got. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, so of, I mean, thank you for presenting both your um, love of Israel philosophically, emotionally, and religiously, um, and some of the challenges. So just well, we'll, let's end with, um, how, what does it feel like when the moment is right, that uh, despite all the challenges, this is the place you need to be and um, are most fulfilled? So what, what's that like when that happens? Um, fulfilling. Um, it is, it's, it, it's 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 indescribable. It's it's undefinable. It's I'll give you just two really really uh, quick examples of when it happened. Um, back before Corona, when I was taking the train um, in Israel, the train has a minion because there's always ten Jews on the train because it's Israel, um, and so I would uh, bring my tefillin on the train uh, and join the Shachrit minion. Um, traveling through Israel. And so to, to daven and look out your window and watch Israel go past you is, is, is incredible. And it sort of brings it all home. Um, Which is also is very one, mundane for a lot of people. That's a, that's a mundane prayer moment for a lot of people. Yeah. Able yeah. To feel that. And it's a mundane prayer moment, I think, for a lot of Israelis. Um, a, uh, uh, a guy I know, actually a, a friend's father, he himself, my, the friend is born in Israel, but the father was not. And he says that it's one of his blessings that he wasn't born in Israel because he gets to appreciate those moments. Um, so, uh, so that's one. In, and then uh, also during this Corona time, um, we, uh, we have been able uh, to get together for prayer because to do so, all we need to do is step out on a balcony. And so uh, Friday evening, uh, for the past uh, month or so until just last week or so we got back to normal. Um, people would just go out on their balconies and sing Kabbalat Shabbat um, at the top of their lungs. And it was, uh, it was spectacular. It was absolutely, I, I'm very disappointed to be returning to synagogue <laughs> after that experience. <laughs> we heard you. <laughs> Sorry, that I just slipped out, I apologize. <laughs> Fred, beautiful. Uh, well, Eric, thank you so much for being here. A shout out to your family once again. Uh, thank yeah, you. I probably just my brother. Did dad leave John? Yeah, he left. Just just my brother. Just John gets credit. Hey, John, how you doing? Glad you're here. <laughs> up for everybody to say hello to Eric. And thank you so much for being here at our Thank Zoom you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Eric, Eric, good to see you. Hey, thank oh, yeah. you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you. Here, I can't say to everyone, but hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Oh, how nice. Thanks.